Hello and welcome to the Wicked Things Podcast. We present to you Stadler House Book 2 Emily. How would you move on if you suffered the terrible loss of your family at a friend's hand? That is what Emily Stevens has been trying to do for almost two decades, but her past seems hell-bent on haunting her till her dying days. She has continued to suffer and now finds herself locked away in a mental health facility. Dr. Stadler, hypnotized and forced her to forget parts of her past, before his incarceration. Dr. Waters, under court orders continues to try and determine if Emily is sane enough to stand trial for murder. Rodney, has moved on as one of the two survivors of the Stadler House Massacre. But it seems fate has put him and Emily in a direct path towards one another. Who knows how this will all end or if it will end. Otherworldly forces are clearly at work in this small town of Port St. John, Florida. The evening sky cast a light purple tint on the old cypress trees along the swampy private road leading to the James Hill home. Emily's red Nissan sedan struggles to pass through the thick mud and muck. The traction from the tires of the small sedan fails again and again. Emily's quick thinking and keen skills of observation are all that prevent the car from sliding into the deep brackish swamp water alongside the path. The smell of rot and decay permeate the air all around the remote gravel-covered swamp road. This secret place's odor has proven itself to be better than any home security system available. The lack of working air conditioning forces Emily to travel here with open windows. She cannot help but gag because of the near-tangible and clinging stench of the stagnant swamp water. Brenda sits on the railing of the long brown porch of James Hill's house, arms folded and brow furrowed with a scowl. She peeks at her wristwatch, shaking her head. Brenda crowds through her frown. Where is this girl? Emily drives along the old gravel-covered road leading to the house of James Hill. She struggles to stay on the narrow road with one headlight illuminating her path. She bangs her hand against the steering wheel. Come on, where the hell is this place? A smile crosses her face, seeing the porch light of the hill house shining against the pitch black of the starless night sky. She taps her horn to announce her late arrival. I hope she's still here. The honk of the horn, accompanied by the headlight from the small sedan, flashes past Brenda. She gets up from her seated position and dusts off the back of her pants. She looks at her watch and grinds her teeth. Where the hell has she been? Emily pulls up to the house along the circular drive. She offers a friendly wave to Brenda, turns off the car, and steps out onto the gravel driveway. The gravel makes crunching sounds under her feet as she crosses to the front door of the house. Brenda holds her frown firm, but unfolds her arms, and gives a shrug in response to Emily's excuses. She shakes her head no, and throws up her open palms toward Emily. Stop! About time you got here, don't you think? Emily recoils, confused by Brenda's aggressive words and demeanor. She reaches into the back seat, grabbing one of her overnight bags. Look, I got the call from Tammy about this transfer of care. I came here right away. I haven't even showered yet. I'm sure I have blood still on my scrubs. I left the house about thirty minutes ago. It's not like this is an easy place to find at night. Brenda shakes her head while she mumbles under her breath. You know what? You're right. I'm I'm sorry. I talked to Stephen this morning. This whole mess is on him. He promised he would have someone out here before noon. He lied to me. Again. She pulls back on the sleeve of her windbreaker to note the time on her wristwatch. It's six o'clock already, with that hurricane gutter band coming on shore later tonight. Emily gestures to her bag and points to the house. She makes her way to the porch, but stops next to Brenda. Emily's cheeks blush from the embarrassment of the situation and says, Well, I'm here now. The sooner we get all this paperwork signed off the sooner you can get back to your family. Brenda opens the front door of the house and motions for Emily to go in first. She pats Emily on the shoulder. Sorry, after talking to Stephen, I figured they would have had someone here much sooner than this. Brenda and Emily enter the house of James Hill. She closes the front door behind them. She shrugs. Sorry, 
He's not much for keeping a clean home. Every time I tried to tidy up, he would complain and throw a fit. The stench of rotting, half-eaten takeout food and the decay of old newspapers scattered across the front room assaults Emily's senses, causing her to gag. She remembers the episodes of the television series called Hoarders, and the inside of the house fits into that show's identification of a hoarder's paradise. The women navigate a pathway through the cluttered front room, crossing sticky terrazzo floors. Brenda gestures to the end of the hallway. Master bedroom is down there. Mr. Hill is asleep right now. If I were you, I would let that old bastard sleep. Emily recoiled in shock at Brenda's venom toward the hospice patient resting in the master bedroom. She shakes her head and motions for Brenda to continue the tour. She follows Brenda into the kitchen, but once again gags at the horrible odor coming from the filthy cockroach-covered dishes stacked along the sink and counter. Emily places her overnight bag on top of the kitchen table. She unzips the bag to reach inside. She pauses for a moment and pulls her hand from the overnight bag, holding a copy of James Hill's sizable chart. Here we go, the chart. We could take a moment before you leave to go over it before rushing off. Brenda retrieves two small coffee cups from the cabinet above the kitchen sink. She peeks inside the cup and then blows inside each. Content with the cleanliness of the cups, she turns to face Emily and offers her one cup. She grabs the metal coffee pot from the stove. Emily graciously accepts the coffee cup and sits across from Brenda at the kitchen table. Thanks. At this late hour, I could use some coffee. That is, if I will stay awake the rest of the night watching Mr. Hill. Brenda wastes precious little time in pouring both the women a piping hot cup of coffee. Emily accepts the hot, bitter, dark, roasted coffee and sips at it. Emily accepts the pour and sips the hot, bitter, dark, roasted coffee. She slides the patient chart across the table, stopping in front of Brenda. They didn't tell me much about the patient. I had to pick the chart up from the office before heading this way. I haven't had a chance yet to familiarize myself with it. Is there anything you can add that's not in the chart? Personality issues? Quirks? Anything else I should know? Brenda flips the chart open, making sure to examine each note. She reads through his list of prescriptions, then careful to learn his known food allergies. Last, she reviews his terminal illnesses, which placed him into hospice care. She takes a long drink from the hot cup of coffee, then places it on the kitchen table at the edge of her reach. Now, everything here seems in order. I've been taking care of Mr. Hill for over a month now. Well, ever since he got out. What do you mean by got out? Was he in a nursing home or something? Emily asked placing the now-empty porcelain cup on the kitchen table. Emily's look of confusion turns to one of concern. She settles back onto the flimsy, plastic, and cheap rolled aluminum kitchen chair. Emily glances around the room for any prying ears and whispers to Brenda, Was he in jail or something? Brenda drums her long, thick nails against the formica layer of the kitchen tabletop, and scoffs at the question presented by Emily. She pours another cup of fresh coffee for herself. Wow, they didn't tell you anything, did they? He wasn't in jail. Mr. Hill has been in prison since the late seventies. Emily jumps to her feet and covers her mouth with her left hand to prevent herself from screaming. She places a hand on her hip and points to the hallway which leads to the master bedroom. Wait! You mean to tell me that... Brenda nods an affirmative yes in response to Emily's partially spoken question. Brenda flips through pages of her own paperwork to produce James Hill's prison medical records. Yeah, that son of a bitch hasn't always been a little old man. Looks to me like he did some real bad things back in his day. You be careful. 
Mr. Hill can be a real jerk when he wants to be. Trust me on that. Emily flops down onto her chair at a loss for words. She grabs hold of Mr. Hill's prison medical paperwork from in front of Brenda. She pulls it in front of herself and at once starts reading through the decades of medical records. Are you serious? This whole thing looks like red flag after red flag on every single page. He shouldn't be alone with anyone. What could have changed? Brenda shrugs and gestures at medical records. She reaches across the table to turn past six pages in the chart. According to Stephen in this paperwork, he served his time. They released him after being deemed no longer a threat to himself or the community. His time in prison broke down his body and will. He fell apart in there. No doubt a result of countless violent encounters or worse while in prison. Emily scans the last of the medical documents, arriving at the page noting James Hill's terminal end-stage illness diagnosis. She clears her throat and reads aloud. Okay, so, late-stage COPD, congestive heart failure, and dementia. Why wasn't he transferred to a care facility rather than home care? Brenda gestures for Emily to continue her examination of the facts presented inside the file. She collects their coffee cups and places them next to the sink, adding to the sprawling mess on the kitchen countertop. He wanted to live out his last days in his late mother's home. The result is Stephen sending you and I out here to stay with him until the end. Emily traces her index finger along each printed sentence, line after line of medical and personal information on James Hill. She rubs her neck as she leans from side to side to stretch out her back, she speaks sarcastically after she finishes reading the last of the details from the current page. Okay, so no family and no children. We're all he's got. Great. Emily's finger passes below the reason for James Hill's incarceration, and her eyes widen. She watches the file as it tumbles from her open hand. Wait. Wasn't he the guy from that trailer park that killed all those people and buried the bodies under the mobile homes of his neighbors? Emily throws her hands up and storms into the cluttered front room. She stops at the front door and turns to face Brenda. Why would I stay here with that crazy old man, or better yet, why the hell did you stay? Brenda seizes Emily's wrist stopping her from running out the door and into the night. She forcefully spins Emily to face her. Seeing Emily in hysterics, she slaps her cleanly across her cheek. For the same reason you probably came here, I needed the money, and this is the highest-paying contract our office has. Besides, the James Hill you remember died in prison a long time ago. Now he's a dying old man in a creepy house in the middle of nowhere. He's waiting around to die. Fine, but don't you ever put your hands on me again. Emily holds the side of her face struck by Brenda and glares. Emily's nostrils flare and brow furrow. If everything is okay, then why are you wanting to leave? Hmm? Tell me that. Brenda puts her hands on her hips and takes in a deep breath. She looks to the ground as she sucks aggressively through her teeth. Mr. Hill is on oxygen. He needs a cane to get around the house. I put his meds in the bathroom medicine cabinet. The child lock will keep him from getting hold of them. He's not a threat, but... Emily doesn't react to the emotional word choices the senior nurse has selected to convey her perceptions of the patient. She wades through the hoarder's piles, creating a maze inside the front room. She reaches the kitchen and motions for Brenda to join her. Other than him being an ex-convict, why are you wanting out of this assignment? You said you needed the money, too. You want to tell me what's going on around here? Emily notices Brenda looking past her out of the kitchen window at the dark night beyond. 
She can see her hands trembling. Her tough outer shell cracks as Emily observes her. It's his sleepwalking that I can't handle any more, or his night terrors. Every time I turn around, something's moved or broken by him during another one of his sleepwalking episodes. I don't know if it's the house or him. I like to read scary ghost stories before coming out here. Now I feel like I have been living in one. Emily narrows her eyes, studying Brenda's face for signs of a smile. She laughs at the notion of the seasoned hospice nurse becoming afraid of a near catatonic patient. Ghost stories, that's what has you wanting to turn tail and run. A sleep-walking old man scared you into giving up your work. Kind of pathetic, don't you think? I mean, the prisoner thing has me worried, but if Mr. Hill is as bad off as you're saying, he can't possibly last more than a handful of days at this rate. Brenda frowns and gestures for Emily to hush. She glances towards Mr. Hill's bedroom. She motions for Emily to lower her voice. Brenda pleads with her from across the kitchen table. You will wake him up. Trust me, you want him to sleep as long as he can possible. Emily takes a deep breath and closes her eyes to calm her nerves down. She sits down to study her nerves, and she flips open the transfer of care documents. She gestures for Brenda to sign the page. Well... I guess we need to get this all signed off. At least then you can leave. I will call Stephen on Monday and try to get some answers from him about this mess. Brenda pulls a black ballpoint pen from her scrub's breast pocket and signs the document. She retrieves a folded sheet of paper from her hip pocket and pushes it into Emily's hands. That's his meds list and times for someone to give each to him. Remember to document all his meds taken or refused by James. Emily studies the list and folds it up, placing it in the breast pocket of her scrubs. Her clear disappointment with Brenda shows on her face. Emily closes the patient chart with Brenda's signature. Great. Thanks for the report. Is there anything else? Brenda steps next to Emily and glances around, ensuring they are alone still. She leans in close to Emily and whispers, Hear me out. If I were you, I would give him a therapeutic nursing dose of his pain meds and hope he dies peacefully in his sleep. What the hell is wrong with you? We're not hired killers. It's our job to make the patient's passing easy and painless. Emily steps away from Brenda, with a look of disgust cemented on her face after her candid remark about the elderly ex-con. She shakes her head and watches Brenda pick up her overnight bag. Brenda practically runs to the front door of the house. Brenda offers a parting glance of concern for Emily's well-being. She opens the front door, steps outside, and tells Emily, If you're smart, You'll do what I was too chicken shit to do myself. If it comes down to him or you, choose you. Try to stay safe. After a couple moments pass for Emily, as she stares blankly at the front door, her mouth hangs open in shock at Brenda's words before her exit. She gets shaken from her stupor by the sound of Brenda's car starting and pulling away from the house. She locks the front door and settles onto a chair in the kitchen. Emily opens Mr. Hill's records to begin a deep information dive into the old man's earlier treatments. Emily starts to commit the first sentence of the chart to memory, but the silence inside the rural country house gets broken by the sudden cries for help from the master bedroom. James Hill's screams find their way down the hallway, erupting throughout the home and all around Emily. Oh, God! No! No! Get out of here! Emily leaps to her feet. Without a second thought, she barrels down the dark, narrow hallway to the door of the master bedroom. She passes the cheap wooden doors to the other rooms along either side of the hallway. She loses her footing 
and slammed shoulder first into the wall at the end of the hallway next to the master bedroom door. Emily groans after impacting the wall. She winces while she rubs her shoulder. That hurt. She reaches out, taking the doorknob firmly in her hand. She twists the brass knob, and a jarring, sharp pain shoots through her injured shoulder like a lightning bolt. At that moment, James screams out in terror again. His voice booms past the master bedroom and echoes into the hallway. Help me! They're trying to take me! His pleas for help send chills racing down the young nurse's spine. I really like this Stadler House series. If you like it to don't forget to throw us a like or subscribe. But for now this is the Wicked Things Podcast signing off. Until next time. Goodbye.